Hello, so in these first few videos, I'm going to walk you through a couple of different options that you have to uh, get Python uh, up and running on your computers. Uh, the first involves no installation of software whatsoever and can com be completely done just inside of a web browser. So if we go to Google and we go to REPL, uh, REPL .it. Um, this is a great online compiler that I've used uh, in the past and so it will prompt you to um, maybe create account, an account if you don't have one you just need an e a valid email address I have my account already logged in right here and so upon logging in we're prompted with a, a little welcome message let's get started it looks like I primarily code in Python Java and Bash so I can click right here to uh, start a new REPL and I can can click any language that I would like. The language that I'm going to work with is Python, so it's right here. I'll give it a name, I'll just call it Test REPL, and I am going to create it. Once I do that, it brings me to, uh, let me close that, it brings me to a nice window here um, where I can type in some of my code. So I can type in things like print hello world, and if I click run, the output is then directed right to the bottom of the screen. And so I can type a variety of code here. I'll say print this is awesome. I'll say uh, name equals input. What is your name? And then I'll print hello name. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. I'll print hello name like this. Don't worry, we'll, fi we'll figure it all out. And so it's, I'm getting all of the output values here. Hello world, this is awesome. What is your name? I'll say my name is Mike. And then it says hello Mike. So REPL is a wonderful, wonderful um, alternative in case you don't have a, the ability to install software to your computer. Maybe you're using a Chromebook to um, try to do some learning. Um, so creating a REPL account uh, is wonderful. And so now if I Let's see, if I go uh, home here and I back out of that REPL, um, I can click My REPLs and it will save all code that we previously have written. So you can see here's a bunch of things that I've done, um, you know, previously in my REPL account. But then here is my test REPL. And so if I click it, it looks like it loads it right back up um, in the state that it was. So it auto saves it for us. Um, so again, uh, a great a great tool for us to use um, if we don't want to install Python 3 directly to our machines. Okay, so uh, in this first video, I'm just going to show you how to get uh, Python 3 installed on your computer. Um, so I'm using a Windows machine here for this video. Um, if we go to Google, we can just Google search Python download. And right here, if I click my first link, it'll bring me to the Python site. I'm going to download the latest version of Python, which is, uh, at the time of this video, Python 3.8.0 for Windows. And it looks like we're getting a downloader right here. Um, depending on the speed of your internet connection, you know, this, this may take longer, it may take quicker. Uh, but once it's done, I should be able to click on my exe file and begin the installation process. Um, so I am going to install the launcher for all users and I'm going to make sure to click here that I add Python 3.8 to the path and I'm going to do the default installation if you look right here which includes idle, pip, and all documentation. For our purposes here, the um, we're going to use idle to do all of our coding. There's other great compilers such as like PyCharm uh, that we can use. But for us, we're just going to keep things simple and we're going to use the default um, the, the default um, you know piece of software that comes with the Python install. So if we click install here, it's going to go through and uh, install Python 3.8 for us. So we'll just let that do its thing. Should finish up here soon uh, in any moment. You almost have to wonder if these like status bars are actually correct or if they just fill you up right here, you know, for the first 10 seconds and then the remaining 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> is there. Okay, perfect. So it tells us that the setup was successful. Um, so I'm going to close this 
And now if I come over here to my programs, I see that I have recently added um, Python and Idle. So if I scroll down uh, to Python 3.8 and I click here, I have Idle, which is the compiler that we are going to use to run our code. So if I click this here, it should open up nicely. Um, right here is the kind of uh, the the shell window, so I can do things like define my variables x equals five, print x, print x plus two, uh, etc. Um, more importantly, I can come here and I can create new files. So if I come here and create a new file, I can name this file uh, test, and I'll just say print hello world which is the first thing that we're going to learn how to do and if I run this now I can click uh, I can click run and run module or I can just click F5 to run this before we run the source has to be saved so I'm just gonna save this to my desktop as test.py and I'll save it and it looks like it's running it right here a few things about idle that you may um, may want to change so let's come over here let's do uh, options let's configure idle um, so some of the things that I've done uh, in terms of the themes I'm using idle dark so uh, I'll keep that and I'm trying to think did I change any of these other themes here or I don't think I did so I think that other than just changing this to idle dark so if I apply this um, now we have what looks like um, you know what I'm using in the videos uh, the other thing that I did I think if I go to um, show line numbers here so the line numbers are nice to have and if you go here to configure I think I changed my font size from 10 to I don't know was it 18 let's just see yeah, I might have changed the font size so that it's a little easier to read for us. Um, but here we have it, right? So I can do all of my things like um, type my code. I can import my libraries that we're going to be working with, etc. So there you have it. You should have uh, Python 3 installed on your computer, and you should be good to go uh, from here on out. So I will make sure to see you in the next video. Hello, students, and welcome back. Uh, in this video, I wanted to just quickly go over where you can find some resources for this free course on learning Python fundamentals. Uh, our first section here just is simply going to be like, you know, an introduction and installation. Uh, and then here we go over some of our fundamental basic concepts. And then we move on to four challenge problems, which are kind of like the heart of this free course. For each challenge problem, you have a quick video that demonstrates the program that I'd like you to create. And then you have a solution video. Uh, accompanying the program demonstration is a resources folder in which there is a challenge guide and completed code for the challenge. Now this is structured for sort of like three tiers of learning. The first tier would be watch the program demonstration and then if we look at the guide and I'll download this, uh, they're a PDF, uh, the guide will give you a description of the program that you're trying to create and some example output. And so this is like our first tier. Using the description and the example output, can you come up with the thought process all on your own and write the program? The second uh, level would be to use this step-by-step -step guide, which sort of walks you along the thought process, you know, but without explicitly telling you how to do it. So print a welcome message, get user input for the first leg of a right triangle, get the input for the second leg of a right triangle, calculate the hypotenuse of the right triangle using a Pythagorean theorem. So it sort of, you know, assists you in completing the program, but doesn't do it for you. The third and final way would be to, let's come back here, download the complete code. Uh, well, let's see, we were doing the right triangle solver. So we'll download the completed code right here. Uh, and you can use the fully completed code with the solution video to uh, effectively complete the challenge. So three tiers of learning for, and you can use whatever suits you best for the level that you're currently at. Uh, so for each of these four problems, please make sure that you get those guides and uh, the code that accompanying each of the problems. All right, I can't wait to see you in our next video. Hello, you made it. Welcome to our first lesson here on your journey to learning the Python programming language. 
Our first lesson today is going to be about one of the most useful functions for us as we progress uh, through this learning, and this is the built-in print function. First off, a function is a block of organized or reusable code that is used to perform a single or related action. Now Python provides many built-in functions such as the print and input functions that we're going to work with in this topic, but you also can define and write your own functions as well, and that's going to be a goal of ours as we move forward. Now functions have a special notation, so we start by typing the function's name. Our function's name is print, and you can see that when I finish typing the word, um, my program here changes the color of the word print to indicate that it's, um, it's a function. We now notate a function by using two parentheses and you place your arguments of the function inside of these parentheses that the function can work with. These arguments are extra pieces of information or directions that the function needs in order to run. So let's see, let's pass the print function um, a message. So I'm going to use two quotes and I'm going to type hello world uh, exclamation point. And so now if I run this, look at that. We print hello world. Quite nice. So what the print function seems to do, it seems to take whatever argument we pass it and it prints it to our screen or our standard output. So let's see, let's try to print something else here. Let's print, this is how we print to the screen. And I'll close that. And so now if I run this, ah, it works just as expected, right? At first, our first print function call prints hello world, and our second print function call prints, this is how we print to the screen. Now, interestingly enough, our print function, if you notice here, print, if I type print and then I, is it not going to do it now? Let's see. There we go. Um, it looks like the print function can take a value as an argument, and that's what we've been providing. This green value right here is called a string, and we're going to talk about that. Looks like there's some other per, um, arguments. There's a separator argument and an end argument as well. And so these are some of the things that we're going to discuss. See, functions, they can have um, required arguments. They can have optional arguments. And the, the way the function operates can change based on the arguments that you provide. So for instance, watch what happens if we decide to provide no arguments. We just pass a print function. Uh, or call the print function with no arguments. And then let's just say print um, what just happened, question mark. So we're going to run this. And if we look here, we printed hello world, just like we expected. And then this is how we print to the screen. Our third print call on line five, when we passed no argument, it just printed a blank line then moving our cursor down to the next line to allow us to print what just happened. So it looks like when we pass the print function no arguments, it just prints a blank line. Now, things can get a little bit more interesting if we use some of the other optional arguments of the print function. For example, this end equals argument is, is an interesting argument. The end argument allows us to change once, uh, what Python does once it finishes printing the line. If we don't specify this optional argument, the default value, the default behavior, is this new line character, backslash n, which we see, which says, hey, Python, when you're done printing hello world, move to the next line. Hey, Python, when you're done printing, this is how we print to the screen, move to the next line. Therefore, though, we can, we can type our message and this time use that end argument. We can change the behavior of the print function. So if I print this is a message on one line and now there's my first argument the value to separate arguments we use commas and now I'm gonna type end equals and I'm just gonna put um, a space let's just put a space so a space is, a, is an actual character right it's inside quotes and I'm gonna close this and now let me print another message I'll say this is a message on the same line, period. 
and I'll close it, this time not calling the optional end argument. And let's see what happens. And so what happens by calling that optional argument, we see this is a message on one line. And instead of the default behavior of shifting that message down to the next line when it was done, the optional end argument overrode that behavior. And it says, nope, stay right here, print a space, and then print this is a message on the same line. It is bothering me that we don't have a period here, so let's put some punctuation. Um, maybe I don't want a space. Maybe I want um, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. I could, I could run it that way, and let's just see what happens. And see, there we have it. So by using optional arguments here, we are um, altering the behavior of this function. Let's go back to the space and keep it just like that. So let's print one more message here. Now, because our last print call, the, the end argument wasn't used, so the default behavior says, hey, go to the next return line. We're going to say, learning Python is fun. Run this, and it does exactly what we expect. So there's a great overview of our first function, the print function. It's going to be used um, in every, almost every um, program that we do here uh, in this class. I hope you enjoyed. Welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed our first lesson. Now we're moving on to a new topic here, an introduction to variables. I'm sure you're all familiar with variables. You all took a math class, hopefully, uh, where we saw something like this, right? x is equal to 5. You see, variables are used to store information. There's a variable name, in our case, x, which we can arbitrarily choose, and then a variable value, in our case, 5, which represents the actual information that's being stored. See, variables allow us to label data with a descriptive name, so our programs can be understood more clearly by the reader or by ourselves. It's helpful to think of variables as containers that hold information. So x is a container that holds a value of 5. Now to define a variable in, in computer science, we use the assignment operator, which is the equal sign. So this is, hey, assign a value of 5 to the variable x. So, I mean, I could call our print function here, print, and I could print the value 5. And if I do that, we should get exactly what we expect. Prints 5, perfect. But what we really want to do is we should print using our variable here, print x. Now, there's a lot of times some confusion here. Sometimes students will think that this should print the letter x to the screen. But if we check here, what this is going to do is instead of printing the variable's name, x, it actually prints the variable's value, 5. And that's because variables are containers, right? When I say, hey, print the variable x, it says Python find the variable x, see the value that it contains, and print that value. This is very different than just printing the letter x. So if I put the letter x inside of quotations, this is not a variable. This is a, what's called a string, something that we're going to talk about soon. So if we run this now, we see that our letter x gets printed. Perfect. So we can store more than just mathematical concepts or numbers, though. We can actually store messages or strings inside of a variable. So for instance, I can overwrite my value of x here. Let's just say x is equal to hello world. And then I can call print, and I'll print x again. If we run this, see, we print our previous information, and then we print our nice hello world message here. Um, this is kind of bad, though. In fact, this bothers me because this is terrible naming convention. See, we can arbitrarily pick our variable names. We ideally would like our name uh, to name our variables such that their names are informative. So since here, maybe we're printing a message, right? We're saying, hello world. Why don't I call my variable message? And in my print function, the argument I should pass, instead of passing the variable x, I'm going to pass the variable message. This should work exactly the same. In fact, it does. We see hello world being printed to the screen. But now this is a much easier code to read with informative variable names. The variable name here is message, and the variable value is hello world. So when I call the print function, I pass the function the argument of the variable name message, and it in turn accesses the variable value of hello world and displays it to the screen. 
we can now update the value of a variable by using the assignment operator. So now I'm going to say, let's make message equal to goodbye cruel world. A little sad there, but now if I print message, it should, let's check, it prints the value of message right here. When message is equal to hello world, it prints that on line 10. And then we overwrite the value by using the assignment operator to goodbye cruel world, and it prints it again on uh, our print call line 13. Let's purposely make a mistake now, right? So let's say here in, in line 13, instead of printing message, let's print um, masag, right? We forgot the E. So if we do this, note, note the output here. When an error occurs in your program, the Python interpreter does its best to try to help you figure out where the problem is. Um, the interpreter provides a traceback when the program cannot run successfully. A traceback is essentially like a record of where the interpreter ran into trouble when trying to execute your code. As you can see here, it says the variable name, masag, is not defined. And this is because our variable is, is named message. We actually spelled our variable's name wrong. Um, a name error occurs when an object's not defined. And we're going to use these error messages to help us debug our code. And so it's nice here. It tells us where the error occurred. It occurred in line 13. So if I come back to line 13, I can find, oh, right there, I forgot my E. And so now I can fill this back in. Um, in terms of like naming variables, there's a few rules and guidelines you should adhere to. First, variable names can only contain letters, numbers, and underscores. They cannot contain spaces. They can start with a letter or underscore, but they should never start with a number. And we should avoid using Python keywords um, and function names as variables. For instance, imagine if I tried using a variable named print. So I say print equals, let's say, um, happy dance, right? And so now if I try to call print print, I'm going to get an issue here because I have assigned to the, uh, a, a new value to the print call. And so I've overwritten this original function that we discussed. See, and it says, it says here an str object is not callable. Don't necessarily worry about that error right now, but just know that when I do this on line 15, the print function no longer exists. We have overridden it. So this is a really bad uh, idea here, uh, and we should keep it, keep it out. So maybe I'll put a comment here using a hashtag, and I'll just say, bad idea to override built-in names. And then we can comment both lines out so that they won't run, but they still exist here um, for our purposes. So that's a nice use of comments. All right, this will wrap up our introduction to variables. Uh, I hope I see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to our next lesson on your first real data type, strings. A string is simply just a series of characters, and anything that is encapsulated inside quotes is considered a string in Python. We can use single quotes or double quotes to identify a string. So for instance, I can say this is a string inside double quotes. If I use single quotes, I can say this is also a string. However, this is not a string because it's not inside quotes. Note here that when I start with the double quotes, I end with double quotes. When I start with single quotes, I end with single quotes. This will give you an error if I start with double quotes and end with single quotes. We have to be consistent in how we define our string. So. Here, if I type the word hello, I'll say this is a string. But if I type hello without quotations, this does not represent a string. But instead, this is a variable. So Python will think that this represents a variable. So um, we can do a lot of operations here with strings, and we've seen some of them, right? We can pass strings as arguments to the print function. So I can print hello. Hello world, right? We'll keep doing that. It's a common convention. So if I run this, it prints our message just, just like we saw in the past. But we can do a lot more with this. In fact, in order to perform a specific operation with a string, 
or maybe with any specific data type or uh, perhaps class, we're going to use methods of that class. Now a method is part of an object. Uh, a method allows an object to perform a specific action. So you can kind of think of methods like functions, right? And we already introduced one function, the print function, which performed the, um, the action of printing information to the screen. Now, the only difference here is that a function is ubiquitous. It works f everywhere. A method, however, belongs uh, specifically to the object. So we're going to use some string methods here today. And in order to do that, there's a special notation. So let's see. Let's start by defining a name variable. So let's actually, let's say full name. So I'll do full underscore name equals, and I'll do, um, I'll do capital J, Johnny, and then space Smith. And I'm purposely writing it out this way, right? And uh, for, for reasons, I'll tell you why. So let's just print full name. Right, so if we print our full name, let's see how this looks. Perfect. We get our full name being printed here, just like we would expect. Now we can do a few things here. Instead of printing the full name normally, I can print um, the, the full name variable with a string method. So I'm going to call my variable name full name. And then the notation to call a method is a period or dot, and then the method's name. So strings have what's called an upper method. And so I'm going to do dot upper, and I'm going to use two parentheses because, again, methods are a lot like functions. So we need these parentheses because sometimes methods need additional information to work. In this case, we don't need any, so we're going to leave the, the arguments blank. Now, if you notice, I opened a parenthesis and closed the parenthesis here. I still have an open parenthesis for my print function, so I need one more to close it. If I run this now, when I print my name, because we called the upper method, it capitalizes every letter in the name. So we get Johnny Smith, like we're yelling. We similarly have a lower method, so I'll call full name dot lower. And if I run that, um, let's just see. It prints everything in lowercase, so it, it prints the, the J lower. Uh, and then what I normally like to use, we have um, a, a title method, full name dot title. So what the title method does is it capitalizes the first letter of each word. And so here we see, right, so maybe a user entered this in as their name, as user input. They forgot to capitalize their letter. We can do some work to make sure that we always standardize the user's input by calling the title method to make sure that the name appears correctly. Um, Let's go a little bit further here. Let's put some spaces at the beginning of Johnny's name. And so now if you run this, see everything is kind of spaced over. Maybe we don't want that. So there's a, there is a, another method that we can call full name dot strip. And what the dot strip method does for strings is it removes any white space that is at the beginning or at the end of the name. And so there you see it, right? That white space was removed. Note here the white space uh, between Johnny and Smith was not removed because the dot strip method only removes white space at the beginning or at the end. And so if you look here, but if I print, you know, full name, none of those changes were permanent, right? So if we run this and I run my module, you know, I still have Johnny Smith here. None of those changes were permanent. So recall that we can always um, update a variable. So I can say full name is equal to, let's do full name dot title. I'll call the dot title method. And I'll also call the dot strip method. So I can actually call these methods back and forth. So now if I print full name here, my last print function, my name should be nice and cleaned up. And it is, right? That white space is removed, and it's nice and capitalized. Very nice. Welcome back. Let's continue our conversation about our first data type, strings. So in the past uh, lesson, we saw how uh, strings operate, and we saw how we could call some basic string methods. Let's continue that conversation. So let's start by defining um, a name. So let's see, I'll do full name. And this time, uh, let's see, I'm going to put the name, I will use the same name, so I'll have Johnny Smith. But now what I can actually do is I can introduce some nice white space. I can use what are called escape characters. 
So if I call an escape character backslash and then T, what this will do, if I print full name, the backslash T character tabs our string in. And so we see we get all this nice white space here. I can also use a uh, escape character, maybe backslash N. What the backslash N character will do is it will move our string to a new line. It's called the new line character. So these two characters are going to be uh, useful when we're trying to format our text output. Uh, backslash T will tab our string in, while backslash N will print us a new line. So if I run this right now, we see Johnny tabbed over, and we see Smith on its own line. All right, let's move on. Now, we can join multiple strings together using a concept known as concatenation, which is essentially the plus sign operator. Now, you might say in basic math that plus sign means to men uh, mathematically add two values. Uh, and it still does if you're working with uh, data types of integers or floats. But when we're dealing with strings, that plus sign operator means to concatenate or join two strings together. That's what concatenation means. So let's see here. Let's define a new variable, first name, and I'll set it equal to Mike. And let's define a new variable, last name, and I'll set it equal to Aramo. And so now, uh, if I want to concatenate or join these two strings together, let's maybe say in a new variable, full name, so I'll override my previous name variable, I don't mind doing that. I'll do first name plus last name. And so now if I print full name and run this, we should get Ooh, see, look at what happened here. Prints, Mike Aramo, all as one line. So maybe I should put a, maybe I'll put a space in between here, plus space. And so now if we run this, we get our nice full name, Mike Aramo. Now I don't like that it's all lowercase, so I'm going to do full name dot title. I'll call the dot title method again, and it will put it in here nicely. Very good. Now, we can also do um, our concatenation right inside of the print function. So I could actually just print first name plus last name. Oh, that's going to give me my lack of a space again. So I'll do first name plus last name. There we go. And so now I've concatenated right in my print function, and it does the exact same thing, except here I did not call that title method. Let's yell our name. So why don't I call dot upper? on these dot upper perfect so if I run that there we have it right we're yelling my name it's perfect now the plus sign operator when we're dealing with strings stands for concatenation but if we're dealing with numbers like integers and floats it stands for addition so we have to be careful of our data types when we're trying to use concatenations for instance, if I print 4 plus 2, I think we all know that this should give us 6. And it does. Because what I'm working with here, 4 and 2, they're not strings. They're not inside quotes. But if I print the string 4 plus the string 2, 4 plus 2 in this case does not give us 6. Instead, 4 plus 2 gives us 42 the string representation because we're actually joining the string 4 and the string 2 together. A common error that students will receive is if they try to take a string 4 and add it to an integer 2. And when this happens, let's let's investigate our error message here. We get an error message on line 15. It says a type error. You can only concatenate a string, not an integer to a string. And so that tells us, hey, right here, we don't know how to, Python doesn't know how to interpret this plus sign. Does it mean to mathematically add? That's what the integer is saying. Or does it mean to concatenate? That's what the string is saying. That's a common mistake that a lot of students will make. So let's see how we could maybe use this um, together. So let's define uh, another variable. Let's just say our variable is message. And we'll say, hello, how are you doing today? What is going on at home. Sure, there's our message.
and so I can print the message. But I'm more interested, I want to know how many letter H's appear in our string here that we've defined. So there's actually a nice method for that. So I'm going to say, uh, I call a new variable, I'm going to call it H count, and I'm going to set it equal to, we're going to type our string variable's name, message, and now I'm going to call the dot count method. And the dot count method actually takes an argument. So we have to put some piece of information inside of these parentheses here. And we have to tell it what letter we want to count the number of occurrences for. Well, I want to count the number of occurrences of the letter H. And so now if I print H count, let's run this. It tells me that there's three H's in this string. So let's count them. One, two, three, four. I see four. What, what, what's going on? Oh, well what's happening here is, is see, we, we said H is lowercase h, and see how this is a capital H? So that actually makes a difference. Those represent two different things. So one of the things we should maybe do is standardize this input. So let's, let's do message equals message dot lower. So we're going to lowercase every um, letter here. And so now if I run this, we get the four H's that we expect, and we see that the hello and what were lowercased. Lastly, let's print a, a nicer message describing all of these letter H's. So I'm going to say print our message has, and I'm going to concatenate to it the variable H count, uh, H's in it, period. So you see I have a, a value here, our message has, I'm at concatenating to an H count, and then I'm concatenating to that, the rest of the message, H is in it. So let's run this. Ooh, type error. Of course, I bet you knew that that was coming because we cannot concatenate integers to strings. And that's exactly what H count is. So right now, we don't necessarily know how to turn H count into a string. And that's something that we're going to learn moving forward. We can do that using another function, the str or string function. And so if I run this, it now should work nicely. Our message has four H's in it. Little preview of what is to come. Welcome back to our next lecture on strings, part three. So we ended our last lecture by sort of introducing, uh, very briefly, a preview of something called the string function, which casts or changes the data type from like an integer to a string so that we could print them in messages. I just want to give a little clarification on that here. So let's start by defining a variable. I'm going to define a variable lyric, and I'm a big Pearl Jam fan, so I'm drinking my coffee out of a mug that's got a lyric on it, and that lyric is, sometimes is seen a strange spot in the sky. And this is nice because there are lots of letter S's here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to count the number of S's that occur in this string. Um, we saw before that the capital S here and the lowercase s is going to give us an issue. So I'm going to standardize this lyric by calling, uh, by updating the value of lyric. And I'll say lyric is equal to lyric dot lower. Uh, and now I'm going to say S count, our new variable, is equal to lyric dot count, we'll call the count method, and we'll pass an argument of the, um, the character s. So that should count the number of s's for us. So let's see, let's print s count just to make sure that this is working the way that we expect it to. And it says we get seven s's. So let's see, I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Did I miss one? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, I missed the is. So now, um, what we previously did is we printed um, a message using concatenation, right? Um, there's another way that we could do this, though. We can put multiple values to print separated by commas. So I could print a string here, our lyric has, and now I can put a comma, and I can say s count. And then I can put another comma and say, so our lyric has, in our case, s count is 7, and then we'll say s's in it, period, and close that. And so this should work just fine. And if we look here, it says our lyric has 7 s's in it. 
And that is wonderful. We don't get that error, that type error, right, where it says you can't concatenate an int to a string. And this is because I think Python, oh, Mozilla crashed. That's fine. Let's just quit that. Um, this is because I think Python is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us in, in converting our data types. Um, while this is convenient, I'm not sure as like an instructor I necessarily like it because it, it takes the um, responsibility of, of managing and thinking about your data types away from the student. And so if we look here, our original way of doing it, our Lyric has, using concatenation, if I just type s count, and then I concatenate again, s is in it, period. This gave us our error, right? And it's because we weren't thinking about our data type. And so we can change our data type here from an integer to a string. And we'll discuss how to do this a little bit more in depth later on. And so this forces us to be aware of the types of data that we're working with. I really like that. So I may go back and forth using both of these methods, but I think I'm going to primarily focus on the method used on line 11, just to, to focus in on the importance of being aware of the data types that you're working with. One of the things I want to note here too is if you notice in line 11 um, when I print my last string I have to put a space here to um, to space out that message, right? If I don't do that, if I get rid of that space and I run this, we see that our print messages, our lyrics have sevens, s's in it, right? It, it looks kind of bad. So we have to format that with the space. But I did not have to do it here on line nine. And the reason why is if you, let's just call my print function again. The, the print function has an optional uh, argument called the sep argument or the separator argument. Its default value is a space. And so that says that when you put multiple values in here separated by a comma, it's going to, by default, separate them with a space. And so we saw that we could override our default behavior. So for instance, if I copy this and paste this here, so there's our three values. And now I'm going to call the separator argument, and I'm going to override its default behavior. Instead of printing a space, maybe I'm going to print, I don't know, a smiley face. That sounds like it could be kind of fun, right? And so now when I run this, by overriding our default behavior, instead of printing a space, it says our lyric has smiley face, seven smiley face, s's in it. Um, just to show you that there are other optional arguments that we can use with that print function. All right, I think this wraps up our understanding of strings. We'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back to our next lecture on a new set of data types, integers and floats. An integer is a whole number that's not a fraction. So for example, numbers like 5, 19, and negative 22 are all integers, while a number such as 2.23 would not represent an integer because it's not a whole number. We can perform all of our basic mathematical operations on integers in pythons. So we can use the addition operator, a plus sign. We can perform subtraction, multiplication, or division using the following operators here. We can also use two multiplication signs to represent exponentiation. Recall that anything inside quotes represents a string. So if I call the print function and print five inside of quotes, my argument is not the number five, but is instead the character five. So what we're actually printing here is a string. However, if I print the number five, the integer five without quotes, what we're printing on line four is an integer. When I run this, um, they sure look like the same output here. Uh, and we're going to learn later on how we might be able to distinguish those two outputs. We can perform all of our basic mathematical operations with integers. So for instance, I can do uh, addition. So 4 plus 2. I could do subtraction. Um, 4 minus 2. I could do multiplication. 4 times 2. I could do division. We'll do 
4 divided by 2. And lastly, I could do exponentiation. So I could do 4 raised to the second power. And let's run this and see what we get. So not that much of a surprise here. It looks like we're printing our fives. And then we have the result of all of our mathematical operations. So 4 plus 2 is 6. 4 minus 2 is 2. 4 times 2 is 8. 4 divided by 2, if you notice here, and this is interesting, we get 2.0. So what is returned here is not an integer, but instead it's a decimal value. These decimal values are known as floats. And a float, so therefore a float is any number that is a decimal value. For instance, um, I could say that 2.2 is a float, or 4.10 is a float. All of our mathematical operations work with floats as well. So for instance, if I have a, uh, a float, and let's store this float in a variable, because we can actually store integers and floats and variables just like we could with strings. So I'm going to say um, y is equal to 4.15. And we'll say print y. If we run this, we print our float, 4.15. Right? It's what's uh, the value of the variable y. I can update the value, though. I can say, hey, let's say y is equal to the current value of y plus 2. So we'll take whatever is currently stored in the variable y and add 2 to it. So if I print y now, instead of reading 4.15, it should read 6.15. And it does just that. This is a common way to notate changing or updating a variable's value. But we can also do this using the following notation. I can say y plus equals 2. And this says, take the current value of y, add 2 to it, and update the value of y. Make that the new value. So now if I print y, it should print, for the last time, uh, 8.15. And it, ju it does just that. We have a similar idea um, if we want to decrease the value. So I could say y is equal to y minus, we'll say 1. And if I print y here, I could also say y is minus equal 1. And so that will decrease the current value of y by 1. So if we run this, we see 8.15, we decreased it by a value of 1, 7.15. And then we decreased it again. Uh, to 6.15. So there are some of our basic mathematical operations with integers and floats. Um, we're going to look at these a little bit more in depth as we move forward. Wonderful. Hello again. In this lesson, we're going to learn a new function, our second function, which is the type function. Variables and the data they represent have a specific data type. For example, let's define three variables. The variable name, which will be John. The variable fave num, which will be 13. And the variable tax rate, which will equal 0 0.4. Each variable here represents a different type of information. The type function returns the type of information represented by the variable. So for example, um, our type function right here takes one argument, the variable name for what we would like to determine the type of. So I could determine the variable type of, I'm sorry, the data type of the variable name. And I'm going to send that to the print function. So I want to print that. If I run this right now, we see that name is a, a class and it's a string. Wonderful. Exactly what we expect because John here, the value of name, is stored inside of quotes. And so let's call uh, a similar command here. Let's call the print function. Let's pass it an argument. And let's pass it the return value of the type function. And let's pass fave num. And let's do the similar thing here, a similar thing here, for uh, tax rate. And so let's see what are these data types. And what we see is, hopefully you kind of uh, knew this ahead of time. We have a string, an integer, and a float. Now, 
there are built-in functions, other built-in functions, that allow us to change the data type of a variable. Uh, and this process is known as casting, casting a variable from one type or another. We have the following functions at our disposal. The string function, str, the int function, int, or the float function. And what we need to do is each of these functions take one argument the value in which you want to change its data type. Um, so this is like the information whose data type you want to change. Now we can permanently change the data type by updating the variable using the assignment operator. So for example, let's take tax rate and update its value. So I can say tax rate is now equal to, and I want to turn this tax rate from a float into a string. So I'll call the string function, str, and I'll pass the current value of the tax rate. Now, if I print the data type of the tax rate, what we get is a string right here. So it's saying, hey, the tax rate variable is no longer a float, but instead it is the string representation of this value. So that permanently changes it. We can also temporarily cast a data to a new type if we don't use the assignment operator. For example, I can print a message here. We'll say um, name dot, and I'll call the title method, name dot title uh, plus uh, apostrophe s. Yes. So John's favorite number is, right now if I just type fav num, and then we'll put a period. If I run this right now, it looks like I have name, which is a string, plus another string right here, plus fav num, which we know is an integer. So Python's going to have a hard time interpreting what this plus sign means. Does it mean to concatenate, or does it mean to mathematically add? And if we run this, we see that error, right? The error is occurring here on line 14, and it says, hey, this is a type error. We can only concatenate strings, not integers, to strings. So I can temporarily cast our data. So what we're going to do is call inside of our print function the string function, str, and we're going to cast the integer value favorite num to a string. This is going to only do it temporarily. John's favorite number is 13, works out perfectly. But if we just check really quick, if I still print the type of fav num, we should see that it's still an integer. So let's just verify this. Yep, and we still have an integer. So another way, and I think we kind of highlighted this, um, another way to print is just to use commas as separate values and let Python worry about the casting. So if I say print name.title, comma, uh, favorite number is, comma, fave num, comma, period. This should work um, perfectly fine. You, and we're using the default separator space. Oh, so if you look here, I kind of got, this is a little awkward because we're using that default space operator. Um, but that's okay for right now. That's all right. Now, again, I think for learning, I prefer the method here because it forces us to be more aware of data types. And this is going to be a crucial skill for debugging more complicated code later on. Um, so just to prove, again, that we only temporarily casted favorite number to a string, not permanently, let's try to do some arithmetic. So let's do fav number. Uh, let's, let's create a new variable. Let's call it added added value equals, let's say, fav number plus, let's add 5 to it, plus 5. And then let's print added value. So hopefully, this mathematical result should still work, because we're adding an integer to another integer. And if we run this and test this, uh, it works perfectly. In fact, mathematically, uh, this works out nice. 5 plus 13 does, in fact, give us 18. So the type function is a great tool, a great function to help us determine what data type we're working with. And then the string, ints, and float 
um, functions can help us cast one variable type to another. Hello, and welcome back to our next lesson on a new function here, the input function. Many programs need to be interactive such that an end user can enter in data or information and then have that data be processed by the program uh, in order to alter the performance of the program. In order to get this data from the user or in order to allow user to input any information into our programs, we're going to use the input function. So the input function on its own has a neat little purpose. It will essentially pause a program until a user hits enter. So for instance, if I put a print message here and say, hello, and I run this right now, uh, that print statement won't occur until the user actually responds on the keyboard. So I could just hit enter, and then we print our message. The input statement becomes a little bit more powerful when we um, pass it an argument. The argument uh, is going to be a prompt or message to display to the screen informing the user as to what information they should enter. So I'm going to say, please enter your name. And so now when I run this, if we look here, that prompt is displayed. Please enter your name. So let's see, I'll put my name, Mike. And our program is still going to run the same regardless of what the user enters. So if I enter in Mike, or if I run this again and I enter in John, it still says hello. It's not interactive yet. The reason why is because this input statement, uh, it's trying to return the value that the user entered. But nowhere are we grabbing that information, or nowhere are we assigning it to a variable. So what we should do here, at the beginning of line three, we need a variable, and I'll call it, we'll say first name, and I'm going to assign a value of the return from our input statement. So when I call this input statement now, Python is gonna prompt, or this prompt is gonna be displayed, please enter your name. If I type in Mike, that value is gonna be assigned to a variable first name, which is really awesome, because now in my print statement, I can say hello, comma, plus, and I'll do first name. And why don't I use the title method to make sure that this is always capitalized. So now if I type in Mike, lowercase, I get a response tailored to me, hello, Mike. And if I run this with a different user input, such as John, all capitals, it says, hello, John. So now our programs are a little bit more dynamic in nature using the input statement. Now, it's really important to note that um, the input function returns all of its data as strings. For instance, let's create a variable called number, and I'm going to set it equal to um, an input statement. And our prompt is going to say, please enter your favorite number. And so we'll print number. But then I also want to print its data type. So I'm going to print in a, the type function. And the type, I want to determine the type of the variable number. So if we run this right now, we're going to get our prompt, please enter your name. My name is Mike. Hello, Mike. Please enter your favorite number. My favorite number is 13. So it prints 13 right here, so we've captured that value. But if you look here, even though it looks like it's an integer, we're being told that it is actually a string data type. Um, this is going to be pretty problematic if what we want from the user is an integer or float. Imagine here, right now if I wanted to add, let's say add 5 to this number, um, let's do um, number plus 5, I'm going to get a type error. And it says right here on line 10, type error. We can only concatenate strings, not integers to strings. Because I have an integer right here. And even though I entered in the number 13, that is being interpreted as a string. So I can quickly uh, overcome that by just calling the int function and passing number to the int function. This is going to cast number to an integer so I can do my mathematics. Uh, and there we have it. We've added 13 and 5 together to get 18. So let's see how this might work in a, a little bit more robust of a program. So we're going to start by printing a message to the screen. We're going to say, give me any two numbers 
and I'll multiply them together. And so now let's create a variable, we'll call it num1, and we'll set it equal to the return of an input statement. And we'll prompt the user by just saying first number here. And we'll do something similar for our second number. Num2 is equal to uh, an input statement, and we're going to prompt the user for the second number. Perfect. Now I need to calculate my product. So I'm going to create a variable, call it product, and we'll take whatever the user entered in as number one, and we'll multiply it by whatever user, the user entered in as number two. And then we should print the results. We'll say the product of num1 and num2 is product. So let's run this right now and let's let's see what happens. Oh, I've got invalid syntax. Let's see if we can uh, figure out where that is. Oh, I forgot my plus sign to join uh, or concatenate these strings together. So I'll enter my name is Mike. My favorite number is 13. All right, so that works nicely. And now it says, give me any two numbers and I'll multiply them together. My first number is four. My second number is five. And we get an error. And our error is on line 16. It says, cannot multiply sequence by non-integers of type string. So I think what's happening here is that num1 and num2, because they're user input, they're strings. We have a difficult time performing this mathematical operation. So one way that we could change this is by taking our user input and turning it into an integer. So I'm going to wrap my input statement inside of the int function, int. Now, when we get down here, num1 is an int, num2 is an int, and we should be able to take their product. So let's check, let's, let's check this. So Mike, my favorite number, let's make my favorite number 15 this time. All right, give me two numbers, four and five. All right, we still got an error, but it's a different error. And so this is good, we can investigate this. This time it's on line 17. And we still have a type error. It says we can only concatenate strings, not integers to strings. So let's look at line 17. The reason why here is I have a string, the product of, it's inside quotes, so it's a string. But now num1, num2, and product are all integers. So I can cast num1 to a string. I can cast num2 to a string. And I can cast product to a string. And so now, if we run this, I am confident that this will work. So 4 and 5, uh, and we see right here the product of 4 and 5 is 20. Perfect, that's really great. Except what happens if a user maybe enters in um, a different number? What if they enter in, my first number is 5.5. .5. Ooh, I get an error, and it says invalid literal for int with base 10, 5.5. .5 because we told Python that we expect an integer here for the first number, and what the user actually entered in was uh, a decimal, and so that's gonna be an issue. So let's do another quick example here. Instead of doing multiplication, let's print, and let's do a new line. We'll say, give me any two numbers, and I'll sum them together. And so we'll call, we can override our variable, so we'll say num1 is equal to, and we'll call the input statement. We'll say first number. And then we'll do num2 is equal to int input, I'm sorry. Uh, and we'll say second number. But here, instead of casting to the integer, let's cast the user input uh, to a float by calling the float function. This will allow the user to enter in a decimal. And so now I'll say sum, ooh, and if you look here, this is interesting because we want to add the two uh, terms together, and so that's called a sum. But you see how sum lights up here as purple? That's becomes, because sum is predefined in Python. Um, there's a sum uh, function. So we should probably not use it as a variable name. So instead I'll call it sum result. 
and I'll set this equal to num1 plus num2. And now I want to print my results. So I'll say print um, the sum of casting to a string num1 and casting to a string num2 being aware of the data types that I'm working with is plus and we'll cast our sum result to a string as well. And I think here this should work quite nicely. And on our second, oh, invalid syntax. Forgot my plus sign operator. There we go. So if we run this now, my name is Mike. My favorite number is 13. Give me two numbers. I'll do 6 and negative 2. And I get the product of 6 and negative 2 is negative 12. Give me any two numbers and I'll sum them together. So if you recall, this we should allow for decimals. So I'll do 4.52 and um, 3.11. Uh, and look at this. This is interesting. The sum of 4.52 and 3.11 is 7.62999999999. One of the things that we're going to discuss uh, later on is how we can round these decimal values to the appropriate level of precision. But for now, I think this is an excellent place to stop. We've seen how the input function works. We see that it returns string data types. And we see how we can cast our string data types to integers and floats so that we can perform um, some mathematical operations with them. Excellent job. Hello, and welcome back. I hope you're enjoying this course so far. I recently had a very nice discussion with a student about how I'm formatting my strings in this course and he brought up some excellent points that I wanted to share with you all. First, there are many different ways that we can format our strings and output text in Python. They all have their strengths and their drawbacks. For our course, I chose to use string concatenation and explicitly convert all variables. This means that if I try to print a string with a float or maybe a list or integer, I'm going to get an error and I have to take precautions such that those errors won't occur. Good news, there are easier ways to do this in Python and I'm going to introduce a few of them to you now. Bad news, uh, I still chose to do the rest of this course with the more maybe difficult string concatenation and explicit conversions. So sorry uh, on that regards, but I will, I will justify my reasonings later on in this video. So after I show you some of these different ways to format strings, I'll give you my rationale um, for my choice and I'll let you be the judge. And I urge you to use whatever you feel is the best for you and will help you most in your learning. So first, let's define some variables of different data types. So I'll say name equals, I'll put a string here, Mike. I'll say age, I'll make it an integer, 33. And I'll say money and I'll make it a float. So I'll do 9.75. So three different types uh, of data types. So first, I'll put a comment here and I'll say uh, print using string concatenation. Um, all right. And so this is just like we've normally been doing. So I'll print uh, name plus is plus. I'll call the string function and I'll convert uh, the integer to a string because I know I can't combine strings and integers uh, and then I'll say and has dollar sign plus let's convert the float to a string so f string money and we'll say dollars period alright so if I run this hopefully we don't get an error uh, and it says Mike is 33 and has nine dollars and seventy five or nine seventy five dollars perfect that looks wonderful. Um, and so you can see here, right, we had to concatenate our different string messages and then convert, uh, explicitly convert the integer and the float to strings. Um, there is another way that we can do this. Another way that we can format strings is to use the dot format method. So I'll say print using the dot format method. And so I'm going to show you that right now, the dot format, and maybe I'll say the dot format method for strings. Okay, so this is a string method for strings. So I'll say print, um, and then 
I'm going to put uh, quotes for my string, and I'm going to put curly brackets, and inside of the curly brackets, I'm going to put zero is another set of curly brackets, and I'll put a one, and has, and I'll put another set of curly brackets, and I'll put a two dollars, period. And I'll close the string. Uh, but I'm not going to close the print statement yet. On this string right here that we have, um, which maybe looks a little confusing. Now you're probably saying, what are these curly brackets? Well, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, I'm going to put dot .format. So I'm going to call the format method. And I'll close my print statement. Now inside of the format method, I have to pass a couple of arguments, namely the respective variables that represent 0, 1, and 2. And I have to pass them in that order. So I'll say name, age, and money, just like that. So if I run this now, we should get the exact same result. And we do, right? Mike is 33 and has $9.75. Perfect. Uh, note here that if I put these in uh, the different order, age, name, money, then we're going to get some funky uh, output. See, 33 is Mike. Well, that's a nice way of talking, I suppose. So let's change that back. So we'll say name, comma, age, comma, money. So there is a good example of how we can format our strings using the dot .format method, another option. Another way that we can format strings is to use f-strings. Now, f-strings were introduced in Python 3.6. They're going to take care of our conversions just like the dot .format method, so we don't have to think or worry about maybe the data type we're using. So let me show you the syntax for this now. So we'll say print using f-strings. So here I'm going to call the print function, and the first thing I'm going to do is type the letter f, not inside quotes, so just the, the literal letter f, and now I'll put um, quotes. And I'm going to put curly brackets, and inside I'll put the name of my variable, name is, curly brackets, and inside here I'll put the name of my next variable, age, uh, and has, dollar sign, and I'll put curly brackets in the name of my variable, money, dollars, and I'll close it. And that's it. That's all I have to do for these F strings right here. It's going to take care of all of the, the, the conversions for me. So if we run this now, Look at that. It does work. So three different ways of doing the same thing. Each, uh, I would say, each with their own strengths and their own weaknesses. Um, clearly, using F strings uh, is the easiest, probably, syntax-wise. Uh, and, and in fact, if I were maybe doing like an intermediate course, um, I would most certainly probably print using either F strings or the dot .format method. So let me justify my choice, uh, although I admit maybe it is a bad one for why I chose to use string concatenation. Uh, first, I'm a self-taught programmer. Uh, I admit it, right? And this is the way I did it when I began learning. And you know what they say, right? Old habits, I guess, die hard. Uh, it, but it worked for me. It helped me get a good understanding of the relationship between different data types and how different data types interact. Uh, second, f-strings, uh, this idea here down here, f-strings were only introduced in Python 3.6, which I think came out in 2017. So any version uh, of Python running prior to that uh, wouldn't be able to run them or use them. Uh, I admit this might be a bad excuse because it's 2020, but there are still a lot of... Um, you know, programs that were written using maybe Python 3.5 or something that came before it that won't have the ability to use F strings. And third, and in my opinion, maybe the most important, you know, as an educator, I wanted to put an emphasis on the understanding of the data types that you're working with. When we let Python deal with the typecasting for us, it sort of puts that understanding in the background. As a beginner course on computer science, I really wanted to make sure that my students were gaining that understanding. Um, you know, if you transfer to another programming language, you might see that you have to define variables and you have to declare the data type of the variable uh, to begin working with them. So being aware of how you're working with data types and how they interact is, is important in some regards. So that's really why I went with my choice to use string concatenation in this course. Um, I'm open to admit that it may not be the correct choice, so I urge you to use the tools at your disposal that you feel will best propel your learning and understanding of this topic.
Besides, the goal of this course, uh, they are best accomplished when you are the one writing your own solutions to these 40 challenge problems that I'm going to present you with. The beautiful thing is that you can have ownership of your programs and write them the way that you want to write them. So I wish you good luck, and I'll see you in the next video. For this first challenge, the Letter Counter app, you are responsible for writing a program that will get a message and a specific letter from a user and then count the number of occurrences of that letter in the given message. Your program should count capital H and lowercase h as an occurrence of the letter H. Your program will then display a message to the user stating the occurrences of the given letter. For example, we have a nice welcome message here, welcome to the letter counter app. We'll put in our name, I'll put in Mike. It says, hello Mike, I will count the number of times that a specific letter occurs in a message. So let's enter in a message and I'll say, hello, how are you doing? Are you happy that the holidays are almost here? Question mark. And now I need to enter a letter. Which letter would you like to count the occurrences of? Let's count the letter H. And according to our program, it says, Mike, your message has seven H's in it. One, two, three, four, five. Well, can I not count? Let's try this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Wonderful. Good luck. To code our letter counter app, the first thing that we should do is print a welcome message. So I'm going to say print. I'll call the print function. Uh, and inside here we'll pass a string. Welcome to the letter counter app. Now we should get user input. So I'm going to put a comment here. I'll say get user input. And we want to get user input for their name. So I'm going to create a variable called name. And I will assign it a value of an input statement. And our prompt will be, I'll put a new line here. And I'll say, what is your name? And I'm always going to want to make sure that this is title cased. And that I strip any white space in case the user accidentally um, hit space a bunch of times in there. And so we now want to print a message saying hello to the user. So I'll say print hello, comma, plus name. And we'll be excited about that. We'll put an exclamation point. We now want to print a message stating the goal of the program. So I'll say print, um, I will count the number of times that a specific letter occurs in a message. And now we need to get user input for the message that they would like to use, as well as user input for the letter that they would like to count. So I'm going to say a new variable message is equal to an input statement because I want to get the message from the user. And so I'll um, put a new line here and I'll say, please enter a message. And I'll do something similar for the letter. So I'll do letter equals, we'll define a variable letter, input, uh, and we'll say which letter would you like to count the occurrences of. We are told that we should probably standardize the message and letter such that capital H and lowercase h both count as the same occurrence of the letter H. So in order to do that, I'm going to take my message and update its value. I'm going to say message is equal to the current value of message, but we're going to call the lower method. So I lowercase everything. So no matter what, if the user enters in capital H or lowercase h, um, it will still count as the same. They'll all be turned to lowercase letters. And I'm going to do something similar here for letter. I'm going to say letter is equal to the current value of letter, and I'll call the lower uh, method. Let me change my um, spelling of the word which here. Now we want to create a variable called letter count and set it equal to the number of occurrences of this given letter in the given message. So my variable letter count is equal to my message is a string. So I'm going to say message dot and I'm going to use the count method. 
And the count method takes an argument, the letter with which we want to count, or the character with which we want to count, that's stored in a variable letter for us. Lastly, I want to print a message stating the number of occurrences of the given letter in our given message. So we'll say print, and I'll put this on a new line for nice formatting reasons, uh, and I'll say name plus comma your message has, um, I'll print letter count, but letter count's going to be an integer, so I need to cast this to a string. Right. Has your message has four, five, six, however not many in there, and we want to print the letter, so I'll print letter, which is a string, so that's good, and then I'm going to put apostrophe s uh, in it. Period. So there's how I format that string, right? So I'm going to put it on a new line and I say, hey, whatever your name was, your message has letter count, so maybe it's four, five, six. And then I'm going to say the letter, so four H's in it. Uh, and I think that this is going to work really nicely here. I'm going to add another comment here, uh, here to say standardize the uh, standardize to lower case. I like to put some comments, and I'm going to put a comment here. Get the count and display uh, results. So I think this here uh, looks like a really nice program. So let's test this. Let's test this and see if this runs nicely. So it says, welcome to the letter counter app. What is your name? So I'm going to put some spaces here, and then I'm going to say Mike. Hello, Mike. I will count the number of times that a specific letter occurs in a message. Enter a message. So I'll say, hello. How are you doing today? I hope that you have a happy holiday. Which letter would we like to count the occurrence of? Let's check the letter H. And so what we see here uh, is that we have seven H's in this message. Very nice. Let's run it again just to verify. If we enter in different information, we should get different results. So my name is Bob. Uh, hello, Bob. I will count the number of letters. Please enter a message. How are you doing uh, today? I think you are awesome. And let's count the letter O this time. Ooh, Bob, your message has six O's in it. So we've accomplished our goal. We've built a dynamic program that counts the number of letters that occur in a specific message. Well done. You are responsible for writing a program that will convert any given speed in miles per hour to a more metric-friendly unit of meters per second. All calculations should be rounded to a set decimal precision of two decimal places. So here we have it, um, a good example. Our header right here says, welcome to the miles per hour to meters per second conversion app. And we're prompting the user to enter in a speed by asking them, what is your speed in miles per hour? So maybe my speed is 25.6668 miles per hour. Sure. I can enter in an integer, or I can enter in a float. And when I run this, um, my program uh, converts this speed directly into meters per second and states that the speed in meters per second is 11.48, rounded to two decimal points. Good luck. OK, welcome to your second challenge here, our miles per hour to meters per second conversion app. The first thing that we're tasked to do is print a welcome message to the user. So I'll call the print function and we'll pass it a string argument that says welcome to the uh, miles per hour to meters per second conversion app. The next step is to gather our user input for their speed in miles per hour and we're specifically told that we should allow the user to enter a decimal value. So I'm going to call an input statement. Um, why don't I put a comment here? So we'll say comment gather user input. And so I'm going to put an input statement and I'm going to prompt the user by asking them, what is your speed in miles per hour? 
and I want to grab a hold of whatever the user entered in here. So the return of the input statement, I want to store in a variable. So I'm going to call this mph and set that variable equal to the input statement here. Now we know that this is going to return a string value. So if we want to do some mathematics with it, we're going to have to convert this um, to a float. So I'm going to call the float function out in front and convert my string input into a float and then store that float value into the variable miles per hour. Next, we want to convert the speed in miles per hour to meters per second. And so I've given you a conversion ratio of one mile per hour is equal to approximately 0.4474 meters per second. So let's make a, a, a comment here, convert to MPS. And so we'll make a new variable, I'll call it MPS, and on meters per second, and I'll set it equal to the current value of miles per hour, which was entered in by the user, times um, 0.4474, our conversion factor. We're now told to use the round function to round this speed to two decimal places. So if you don't know how the round function works, I would suggest looking up the Python documentation for information. In fact, maybe we can do that right here. Let's see, Python uh, round function. So if we look, it looks like it says, uh, the round function returns a floating point number that is rounded version of the specific number. The default number of decimals is zero, meaning that the function will return the nearest integer. And here's the syntax, right? We type the function name round, and then we pass it uh, an argument that's a number. And it says here that this is required, right? This is the number that is to be rounded. And then we pass it the digits, and it says that's optional, the number of decimals to use when rounding. And it's optional because there's a default value. That default value is zero. So let's pull our code back up. I think we should uh, use this new function. So we're going to say, hey, we want to update the value of our meters per second variable. So I'm going to say meters per second equals, and I'm going to call the round function, and I have to pass it, and see right here it pops up, uh, a number and then uh, digits to round uh, the number of decimal points with which we round, want to round to. So the number that I want to currently round is the current value of meter per second, MPS, and I want to round it to two decimal places, just like that. Lastly, we want to print a message to the user that informs them of their speed in meter per second, meters per second. So I'll say print and I'll say your speed in meters per second is and then I'll print my meter per second variable and let's put some punctuation here period but of course right here I have a float times a float that means meter per second is going to be a float which is going to be an issue when I try to print it here with the string so being aware of our data types I should cast meters per second to a string, and I'll put a space in here uh, so we can read this a little bit nicer. Uh, and I think that this does it. Let's test this code now. Uh, by the way, you can run your module here uh, in idle by running, or you can see you can click F5 to do that. And so sometimes I do that um, to run the program. All right, welcome to the miles per hour to meters per second conversion app. What is your speed? Let's do, let's just do an integer. Let's see if that works. 80 miles per hour. We're speeding down the highway. Your speed in meters per second is 35.79. Excellent. Let's close this. I want to put some white space um, here. I, um, I think I want to put a backslash n, a new line character right here on our input. So it puts a space between our header and our input statement. So let's try this now. Uh, that looks a lot nicer. Welcome to the miles per hour and meters per second conversion app. Let's enter in um, 74 point, well, let's be law abiding citizens. We'll say we're going 54.99 miles per hour and our speed in meters per second is 24.6. Perfect. If you notice here, we've only rounded to one decimal point uh, and that's because this must work out to be exactly 24.6. The, the decimal precision is the maximum number of decimals. So the most we'll get is two. 
Um, this works wonderful. Uh, excellent job with your second challenge program. For our third challenge problem, you are responsible for writing a program that will convert a given temperature in degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius and degrees Kelvin. Your program will round all conversions to a precision of four decimal places. Lastly, your program will display the results in a convenient table style format. So here's an example. We have a nice heading here, welcome to the temperature conversion program, and we are asked to give the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll give 212.52 degrees Fahrenheit. And when I hit enter, we get our outputted temperatures. I have my degrees Fahrenheit, I have my degrees Celsius, rounded to four decimal places, and I have my degrees Kelvin, rounded to four decimal places, with all of the temperatures uh, tabbed over nicely and aligned. Good luck! Welcome to your third challenge problem, a temperature conversion app. The first thing that we would like to do is print um, a welcome message to the user, so we'll call the print function and we're going to pass it an argument of a string uh, that will read welcome to the temperature conversion app. Alright, wonderful. The next thing that we're asked to do is to get user input for their given temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and we should allow the user to enter a decimal temperature. So let's see, I'm going to put a little comment here, we'll say gather user input and let's grab that temperature. So we want the temperature to be given to us in degrees Fahrenheit and we want to use that um, temperature later on in our program. So I'm going to store the return value of an input function in a variable and I'm going to use a variable tempf to represent my um, Fahrenheit temperature. And so let's see, the prompt that I want in this input, I'll say what is the given temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Now we know that this is going to return a string. We're going to want to do some mathematical conversions, so we want to um, cast this or convert this to um, a float. So I'm going to call the float function and I'm going to put my input statement inside of the float function. So, you know, think about this like order of operations, right? We work from the inside out. So the first thing that we're going to do is get the input statement then we're going to turn that into a float and then we're going to return that to our variable tempf. Um, so that looks quite nice. Our next step says convert the temperatures into both Celsius and Kelvin. If you're unsure of the conversion ratios, Google is your friend. So, you know, um, my personal opinion is that, you know, programming, computer science, none of it is sort of done in a vacuum or on an island. Um, look things up if you're not sure. Try to get guides. Use other resources. It's a good skill to know how to do. Um, so I will give us the conversion ratios um, here in this example, but perhaps maybe you spent some time to research that, and if you did, that's wonderful. Uh, we're also noted here that we want to round all of our decimal places to four values. So let's see. I'm going to put a, a comment here. We'll say convert temperatures or convert temps and so I'm going to make a variable I'll call it temp C for our Celsius temperature and the conversion here to take Fahrenheit into Celsius I'm going to take five ninths so five divided by nine and I'm going to multiply that by um, our Fahrenheit temperature uh, minus 32 degrees so temp F minus 32 so I think that that's going to convert nicely for our Celsius temperature. And now that I have that Celsius temperature to get a Kelvin temperature, so we'll start a new variable temp K for temperature Kelvin. We just take the Celsius temperature, so temp C, and we add 273.15 uh, to it. So there are our conversions. Again, how am I getting this information? Well, I just looked it up. I looked up uh, on Google how to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius and then from Celsius to Kelvin. Now, we want to make sure that we round all of our temperatures. So I'm going to put a comment here. We'll say round temps. And I'm going to take the current value of temp F and I'm going to round it. So I'll call the round function. What do I want to round? I want to round temp F and I want to round it to four decimal places. So I'm going to update the value of temp C again by 
using the assignment operator, the equal sign, and we're going to set it equal to uh, the output of the round function. And what do we want to round? We want to round the current value of temp c to four decimal places, and we're going to do something similar here for temp k, for our Kelvin temperature. So round temp k, comma, four. All right, excellent. The last step here, we're asked to display all three temperatures um, such that the temperature values are aligned when printing. So let's see, we'll maybe call this uh, a comment here. We'll do summary table. So this is our summary table. So I need a print uh, my print function, and I'm going to print, let's put a new line character here so that it spaces, puts the, a little space between our input statement and the summary table. And I'll say degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then I want to put some white space here. So actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to insert a backslash T for a tab character. So it's going to tab my line over. And then I'm going to print temp F. But of course, this is going to be a float. So I'm going to cast temp F to a string so that it, we can print it in our print statement. I'm going to do a similar thing here for degrees Celsius, except now I'm not going to use the new line character because I don't want to put a new line in our table. So degrees Celsius, and we'll put a tab character to tab over, introduce some white space. We'll call the string function, and we'll pass the string function uh, temp C. So it casts our float value of temp C to a string. Lastly, but not least, we got to do this for our uh, degrees Kelvin. And so I'll call backslash t plus call the string function and let's cast our variable temp k, which is a float to a string. Be careful that make sure that you, anytime you open a parenthesis, you got to have a closed parenthesis. So if you notice, right, this first set of parentheses is for the string function. The second parenthesis here closes my print function. Uh, I think this is going to work quite nice. <clears throat> so if I run this, uh, welcome to the temperature conversion app. What is the given temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? So let's see. I'm going to enter in 212.52, uh, and we get some nice values here, four decimals. Oh, but this doesn't look aligned here, right? Our temperatures aren't aligned. And the reason why is because there are less characters in the string degrees Kelvin than our other two strings, degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius. So when I do the tab, it only shifts it over um, a minimal amount. So for this line, I actually have to introduce a second backslash T character. So let's do that right now. In line 20, I'm going to add another um, tab character. That should take care of that mistake. And also, I want to introduce some white space here <clears throat> between the header and my input statement. So on line 6, I'm going to introduce a backslash N character to give me that desired white space. So now if I run this, let's see, welcome to the temperature conversion app. What is the given temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? Well, let's say it's a little chilly out. It is 32 degrees out. And this is nice. We get degrees Fahrenheit, 32.0. Degrees Celsius is 0 degrees. And this makes sense because this is actually the freezing point of water. So 32 and 0. And then we get degrees Kelvin is 273.15. Wonderful, wonderful job. I hope you enjoyed this problem. Great work. Welcome to your next challenge problem. In this problem, you are responsible for writing a program that will calculate the hypotenuse and area of a right triangle, given its two bases. Your program will round all calculations to a precision of three decimal places and provide a summary of the mathematical results. So let's see this program in action. We have a nice header here, welcome to the right triangle solver app, and we are prompted to enter in the first leg of the triangle. So I can enter an integer, such as 20. And then we're prompted to enter the second leg of the triangle. I can enter a float, such as 40.5. Our program then computes the hypotenuse and states for a triangle with legs of 20 and 40.5, the hypotenuse is 45.169, rounded to three decimal places. And it then computes the area. For a triangle with legs of 20 and 40.5, the area is 405.0. Good luck. I hope you enjoy this problem. Okay, welcome to our fourth challenge problem, the Right Triangle Solver app. 
The first thing that we're asked to do is to print a welcome message to the user. So we'll say print and let's pass an argument as a string. We'll say welcome to the right triangle solver app. Wonderful. Um, next, we are asked to get user input for the first leg of the right triangle and to get user input for the second leg of the right triangle. So let's put a comment here. We'll say get user input and we want to use these uh, inputs so we're going to store them in some variables. So I'll call our first leg side A and I'll set it equal to an input statement. And let's have the prompt be what is the first leg of the triangle. Wonderful. Now we know that this uh, return from an input statement is going to be a string. Since we're going to want to work with this, um, do some math with it, um, we need to cast this to an integer or a float. But we want to allow our user to enter in some decimals, so we'll cast this to a float. All right. Wonderful. Let's create another variable called side B. And we'll do the exact same thing. So I'm going to call the float function, and inside of it we'll have an input function and we will prompt the user by saying what is the second leg of the triangle. Very good. So I think we have our uh, user inputs done correctly. Now we need to calculate the hypotenuse of the right triangle using the Pythagorean theorem. So if you don't remember the Pythagorean theorem, uh, it's something along the lines of a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. However, we need to solve for c, the hypotenuse, where a and b are the two uh, bases of the triangle. So in order to do that, we have to take the square root of both sides. So c is actually equal to the square root, and I don't, we'll just notate it this way, of a squared plus b squared. So that's our end goal. That's the, the type of formula that we want. Now we actually uh, can't take a square root uh, with basic Python. Uh, in order to take the square root, we need to import an extra library of code. In order to do that, we're going to use an import statement. And these should go at the top of your code as your first line. So we're going to come up here to the top of our code just below our comment and we're going to type import math. This is going to import um, the math library which holds a lot of higher level mathematical functions such as the square root function. And so our square root function is SQRT. We don't have access to this normally but we can access it by importing our math library. So let's get rid of this and let's put a comment here. Um, we'll say this is where we're going to hold our calculations. Okay, so let's see. We want to calculate side C, right? Side C, our hypotenuse. Well, we saw that we need to take the square root of the sum of side A squared and side B squared. In order to use the square root function, we have to first type the math library's name and then, just like with um, strings, we had methods that used the dot notation. We're going to use the dot notation here, and we'll call the square root function. So this is how we do this, right? Math dot square root. And inside our parentheses, we need to pass the square root function, the argument, as to what to take the square root of. Well, we want to take the square root of side A squared. So exponentiation requires two multiplication signs, plus side b squared. And there is our results of the Pythagorean theorem right there. Now we want to round, um, we should round this to three decimal places. So I'm going to say side, side c is equal to, we're going to update its value by calling the round function and we'll pass it the current value of side c rounded to three decimal places. We should also get the area now. Um, so we have to calculate the area of a right triangle. So if you recall, the area is equal to one half um, base times height. That's our formula for the area of a triangle. So I'm going to do uh, 0 0.5 times um, our one base, which is side A, times the height, which is our second base, side B. And we'll round our area, uh, again, we'll round it to three decimal places. So I'll do area, comma, three. 
Lastly, we need to print a message to the user informing them of both the hypotenuse and area of our given triangle. So let's put a comment here, we'll say summary, and our summary is going to look something like this. So let's see, print, um, let's put a new line character in here to give some space. Oh, and while I'm at it, because it seemed to always forget, I want to put some space between the header and our input statement. So on line 7, I'll put a new line character here to kind of space this out a bit. So we have four, let's see, for a triangle with legs of, we'll end that string, and let's print uh, side A, and we'll print side B, the hypotenuse is, we'll print side C and we'll end it with a period. Now, side A, side B, and side C are all floats, so let's cast them to strings using our string function. We gotta be aware of our data types, right? Um, otherwise, we're going to get errors. All right, I think that print function looks pretty good. Um, and I'm actually gonna copy this whole line and paste it on line 19. Let's get rid of the new line character and we'll keep uh, everything here except we'll say the hypotenuse. Instead of hypotenuse we're gonna say the area is and instead of printing side C here we're gonna print the variable area. I think that is going to do it for this problem. Let's run this and check. Get some verification here. So welcome to the Right Triangle Solver app. What is the first leg of the right triangle? So let's, let's test this with an integer 20 and a float 40.5. Um, and we get the output. It looks like exactly what we expect. Um, so we get the hypotenuse is 45.169 and the area is 405. Let's just run it again one more time. Let's test it with some other variables. Let's do... Um, uh, ooh, here's a common one, right? A three and four. And so the hypotenuse is five. This is one of our special triangles, the three, four, five triangle. And our area is uh, 6.0. Wonderful. Excellent job.